Welcome to the first great debate of this year's Share EGU 2020. My name is Jenny Turton. I'm a postdoc at the Friedrich Alexander University in Germany. Um, today I'm the lead convener for the, the great debate. Our debate today is called Cutting Carbon in the Geosciences. And we will focus on two specific areas, both fieldwork and um, conference attendance. So actually this great debate is very well timed with the first virtual EGU. And this is the first virtual um, great debate that's ever been hosted. So hopefully everything runs nice and smoothly. We will be taking questions from the audience using the Q&A box, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Please use the Q&A box and not the chat box. And this enables the panelists and the conveners to see the questions. Um, periodically, I will be gathering the questions and putting them to our moderator, who I will introduce in a moment, and then he will be able to pass the questions on to the panellists. So with this, I would like to introduce our moderator today. His name is Professor David Vaughan, and he's the Director of Science at the British Antarctic Survey. Welcome, David. Thank you very much, Jenny, uh, our convener, for the first ever EGU uh, Great Debate uh, online. This is um, an historic moment, and I'm uh, joined today by four panellists, who I will introduce in a little while, um, to discuss one of these most pressing and urgent uh, debates in geoscience at the moment. This debate was planned prior to the COVID-19 pandemic and would have been held at the EGU in Vienna with perhaps a potential audience of, of 18,000 scientists, science communication, communicators uh, and students. But today we are meeting in a virtual sense, in a, in a very different world to the one in which this debate was planned, where perhaps the most pressing thing that we have in our minds is the global pandemic. Um, but nonetheless, this overlaps and changes the way that we also think about our contribution to carbon. All across Europe, indeed much of the rest of the world, our governments have called for a temporary change in our life and almost nothing I think will, will ever be the same again. Um, sitting at home here under lockdown i think many of us are questioning uh, what we got used to in our lives and wondering how things will change in the future so i think this debate could have not come at a more interesting or relevant time um, and i i think uh, it's really exciting morning to be discussing this so without much further ado let us begin um, we're all aware of the rise of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and that this is having an enormous impact on our planet and that as a species we have very little option but to reduce the impact that we're having on, on this planet to find a more sustainable way to live in. Today our debate will come in two halves. The first around how we can envisage a future where scientific conferences are perhaps less of a significant feature in many of our lives um, and the second around how we can actually do science in a more effective and sustainable way how our trips to undertake field work can be reduced and uh, questions around the, all of those things so there are two specific areas for discussion um, I will introduce our speakers in the briefest terms and allow them just a, a couple of points to set out their debate, uh, their stalls, if you like, within this debate. And then we'll ask them some more specific questions and then open the floor to questions from the audience. As Jenny said, those questions should come in through the Q&A box and we will bring to met together as many of those questions as we can and uh, ask those of our panel. So let's meet our panel. Um, this is an interesting mix. These are not just people, not just people who make policy, but also people who've taken things into their own hands to make things better. And people who are already established in their careers. And also those who will have to live through entire careers with the answers to the questions that we face um, and so those people are looking forward to how things may change in the future so 
Suzanne, Ella, Mark, Sudhir, uh, welcome. I'll start with you, Suzanne. Professor Suzanne Berthier, um, uh, a committee chair for the EGU and a professor at Aachen University. Um, you've been, I think, instrumental in swiftly changing the EGU's approach and bringing in this online format that we're all going to be involved with this week. You have first-hand knowledge of the advantages and the challenges of hosting big conferences online, um, but you also have an experience in field work as well. Um, so Suzanne, uh, EGU's had to do some remarkably quick uh, footwork to get where we are literally today. Um, is this really just coronavirus or, 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 or were there other drivers towards uh, changing this uh, format? Uh, to, to be honest, we would never have gone 100% online this year if it hadn't been for Corona. Um, and, and I wouldn't recommend anyone to bring a meeting of our size online in just six weeks, which is why we've been calling it um, a big pilot experiment. Um, but what we hope that the experiment will allow us is to gather insight into what will work with a, a virtual conference um, and maybe take part of that into our future meetings. Um, I mean, we've been, the, the last years, I mean, it, it wasn't just Corona and six weeks jumping online because already the last years we've been thinking a lot about the environmental impacts of our General Assembly. And we've been asking participants to travel by public transport, um, we give um, a, a metro tickets with the registration um, in Vienna. We were going to have bicycle stands this year next to the conference center. We have water fountains. We have no plastic glass for any drinks. We uh, no plastic um, cups for any drinks we serve. We were going to face out our coffee cups. Um, no printed program book, paper badges, no carpet. We were doing a real lot. Um, at the same time, um, and without it, we have done a full analysis. Um, I think that the, um, the largest part of the carbon footprint of the General Assembly probably comes from travel of participants to Vienna. Mm -hmm. And in the last few years, I was looking at the, the results, it's EGU has grown year by year. Um, was it 18,000 participants last year? How many were you planning to host this year? It, is that just going to keep growing? Uh, certainly, the, it seems like people's enthusiasm to come to Vienna and EGU is growing. How are you going to deal with that? I mean, it, it's just wonderful that people are enthusiastic to come to the meeting. But it's true, we've been steady growing. I mean, um, we looked into the numbers and it's about 1,500 per year. So last year, we had over 16,000 abstracts and participants. This year, we had 18,000 in program. So we were expecting 18,000 participants. Um, but our goal is not growth. So we've actually been trying to, to dampen the growth. So our goal is to deliver um, a good meeting experience for all in an accessible and sustainable manner. Um, and we've been discussing different ways of organizing the meeting. And in fact, at the last program committee meeting in February, we had active discussion groups exactly on what we can do to further reduce the, the impact. Um, and we didn't get much further with that because we were overtaken by Corona and bringing the meeting online. <laughs> but, um, one, one of the, the big hurdles for us has been um, the discussion of, say, a lot of the discussion has been about hybrid formats. So we would have a meeting in Vienna and allow remote attendance. Um, but often when people discuss this, it's about the orals. So you can web stream the orals. But two thirds of our presentations are posters. That's 10,000 posters it would have been this year. And how do you bring these, these online in a way that you give an equal opportunity to, to the presenters? Um, so we've been trying a different format this year with displays, and maybe we will take part of that further um, for next year's, who knows? Um, thank you, thank you very much. Let's move on to uh, Ella Gilbert, um, who is a, PhD student uh, with my own institute, the British Antarctic Survey, but also the University of East Anglia in the east of England. Uh, Ella has some experience in field work during her PhD, but she's also an extremely active science communicator and has a, a significant presence online. Um, Ella, welcome. Uh, I hear you've just submitted your PhD. Is, uh, is that gone well? 
Well, I don't know. Uh, we'll find out, I suppose, at the Viber. <laughs> well, absolutely. Good luck for that. Um, I guess this is a, big, a, a time for you to really reconsider and think where you're going. Is it a rude question to ask whether you're going to stay in active research or are there other things that you think that you can do with your enthusiasms and uh, around this debate? Not rude at all. It's something I've been uh, doing quite a lot of soul searching about actually. <laughs> um, I'm still at a bit of a crossroads. Like so far in my career, I've sort of been collecting accolades and qualifications. So people take me seriously as a uh, expert scientist. Um, but I've sort of reached the end of that road now. So I'm trying to assess how best I can contribute in a meaningful way to communicating about climate change and also contribute to climate action in a way that actually achieves something. Um, so perhaps unusually I became a climate scientist because I was a, an activist and campaigner first. I don't know how many uh, people have uh, joined sciences in that way. Um, but I was involved in a lot of environmental campaigning and activism since, I don't know, 2007 or so, um, particularly around the impacts of the fossil fuel industry and aviation. So I've made a lot of personal changes to my life as a result of that. So, you know, things like going vegan or um, I think I stopped flying short haul in 2008 um, and I've dramatically tried to cut down how much I fly generally. So since then I've um, only been flying for field work or for very important personal reasons. So that's that's my kind of motivation and background. But I'm lucky because I live in Europe and um, I work at an institute which is very supportive of low carbon alternatives to things like uh, conference attendance and it's I mean I'm also fangirling a little bit over Mark because his website's been my absolute bible for the last 12 years <laughs> um, so yeah train travel and bus travel in, in Europe is a lot easier than it is in other parts of the world so yeah those kinds of things are very important to me and I'm really pleased to be on the panel of this debate. Thank you very much. Um, let's move in on to uh, Dr Sudhir Tiwari uh, who joins us uh, from Bombay, a completely different time zone today, and who works for the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay. Um, Sudhir, you, you have to fly to conferences, I guess, uh, several times a year. Um, how, how and why do you, what benefit do you find in flying to those conferences and, and to joining some of these big uh, uh, meetings? Okay. First of all, I thank to conveners for uh, inviting in this debate. Uh, I fly to conferences uh, basically to meet people and make uh, like uh, collaborations uh, who are working in different fields. So, and also like uh, when you meet people, so uh, there are uh, something like uh, some confusion in some concept or uh, some software, you can uh, meet people, that people in person and you can clear your doubt or that concept in person, which uh, you can mail, but uh, in person you can uh, like uh, do uh, in a, good way like that okay and what would you what would you miss if you if you actually found it hard to attend those meetings in person uh, do, you, do you feel that there could be online and virtual ways to interact that would work sufficiently or or actually you're still going to miss something by not coming to those meetings like easy yeah uh, like easy at the uh, at one place you can interact uh, with many pupils within uh, one week of time and uh, you can have uh, different ideas for uh, future workings and like that. So uh, uh, like uh, when you attend a virtual meeting or virtual conference meetings uh, uh, you cannot uh, explore like uh, you are in conference, uh, you can go via posters and attend several seminars. So uh, in life, uh, I think it is better to interact with, uh, with person. Okay, thank you very much. And exchange ideas. 
our last panelist today is Mark Smith. Um, Mark Smith was the founder of a website that Ella mentioned just a second ago, seat61.com, um, which is a website that, as I understand it, doesn't sell um, tickets uh, to trains, but provides information about how to travel on trains effectively for pleasure, for business. Uh, Mark, this sounds like a, a tremendous resource. Uh, how long has it been going and why did you set it up? Oh, good morning. Um, well, it's, it dates back to 2001. Um, I used to have a proper job, um, about as far from a scientist as you can get, working for British Rail um, and later the Department for Transport. But um, I managed to get a web page online, just uh, mucking around with your computer as you do. And I thought I would do something about how, on the one hand, easy practical, affordable, and above all, enjoyable it is to take the train from the UK to Spain, Italy, Austria, Budapest, wherever. And on the other hand, how downright impossible it has become to find anyone in the commercial world who will tell you how to do it. And I mean both the rail industry itself, which tends to work in silos uh, and doesn't work together, and the wider travel industry, which is really set up to sell you flights, flights, car hire, and more flights. So I thought I would be subversive and put the information on how to get to each of the major destinations in the major countries of Europe online. The train times out, the train times back, how much it costs, photographs of what the trains are like, as people don't know, and most importantly, how to buy the tickets. And that's really the crux of it. We've got 50 different ticketing systems. Uh, the days uh, in the 1980s of me sitting in an office during university vacations issuing through tickets from London to Istanbul on blank ticket stock with a biro are long gone and we live in a world where almost you need a separate ticket for every train which is yield managed like airfares in that specific operator's ticketing system. So it's a, it's a bit of a jungle and I thought I would try and help people find their way through that jungle. And why, why seat 61? I always forget to mention that. It's, it's the best seat on Eurostar. Eurostar first class, I would always treat myself to that seat if I was going somewhere special. Well, uh, yes, okay, so I have not seen the inside of Eurostar first class, but uh, it's certainly a useful, uh, a useful line that we use. Mark, the post-coronavirus, do you, do you think trains are going to, uh, international travel by trains is going to be more problematic? Essentially on a train, you're passing through perhaps several countries before you reach your destination. Whereas with an aircraft, you're flying from one to the other. Do you imagine that that's actually going to be an issue in coming months and years? Um, well, on an aircraft, you almost have to be sitting elbow by elbow to make the economics work. Um, on a train, there is much more space. It's not as critical to cram people in. So it could be that social distancing on a station and uh, on trains is actually easier to do, uh, more economic to do um, than on air travel. Uh, and of course, we're in a situation where the airlines are taking a big hit. Most of the national rail operators are going to, uh, they're, they're state owned, they're, they're uh, fairly certain to survive. So we could see a world where there aren't as many cheap airfares around, there aren't as many airlines around, and actually it's another push towards, uh, towards road travel, even over longer distances. And that's a, that's a very optimistic uh, look forward. Um, I was just gonna mention my own background. Um, as, as somebody who's been working in science now for uh, a little over 30 years, I, I feel I've benefited enormously um, from cheap air travel and attendance to many conferences around the world and to undertake field work. Um, I feel like now this is almost an aberration of history. That one period that my career happened to span may well be looked back at in a few years time as the, the, the really the golden age of cheap air travel. Um, and I actually say, would admit to feeling somewhat guilty about having had uh, that access to um, places around the world. But I think there's little, little doubt that 
certainly over the last few years, I've reduced my air travel um, and actually now try and limit myself to one or two trips uh, overseas, certainly intercontinental every year. Um, but I know that many from my generation perhaps will feel a little bit um, like we've seen the best of it and that others may have to actually live with the consequences of that uh, uh, cheap and uh, available air travel. Um, so let us begin with some of the more detailed questions. Um, I think there is still a sense, and many people have said to me, going to conferences is not about sitting in the rooms and watching presentations. A lot of the business that actually happens goes on after the main meeting has ended, um, finding people to go to restaurants with uh, and perhaps even bars and talking in a more informal way. Suzanne, is there any way that EGU and uh, similar organisations can actually help produce that sense of community that arises from meeting people face to face? And, I mean, for, for, for me, one of the main reasons uh, we go to, I mean, we've been thinking a lot about why do people go to scientific conferences? And it's because they want to present their research and want to learn about research of others. And I think part of that you can do probably in, in virtual ways, but the, the in-person aspect, so you, you're, you're meeting people and, and not only the people you already know, your colleagues, but especially making new contacts. I think that's where a real value of conferences lies and that will be very difficult to, to, to do virtual. Um, yeah, the, the aspect of just spontaneously meeting somebody at a poster session and having a chat and, and then this way making new contacts. Hmm. Ella, we, is, this, is this simply, uh, perhaps sorry to, to, to accuse you of this Suzanne, but is this the problem that uh, perhaps an older generation has with getting up to date with social media? Sorry, uh, <laughs> let, me, let me direct that just to myself Suzanne. But, Really, are there opportunities? I, I, I feel there is a, a wide and international community building up in, within social, social media space that uh, perhaps we're not aware of. As, it's not quite as apparent. Yeah, I mean, I've made several very useful and important professional contacts via Twitter, um, which has been really, really amazing. And I've you know, collaborated with people um, without having met them at all. Uh, purely because of because of Twitter and the way that I use it is that I very carefully curate who I follow um, so that it is just the kind of people that I really need to or want to get in contact with. Um, that does require the people that you want to get in contact with to be on Twitter. <laughs> so it's an, a self-selecting group. Um, but I think there is more and more um, awareness of the importance of kind of social networking online as a tool for professional development and for collaboration across institutes. And it's, it's also much more equitable, right? Because we can't all afford necessarily to attend conferences. You have to have the funding to do so. You, it's often difficult for early career researchers or researchers in developing countries to find the funds to do that. And it's a much, it, it levels the playing field to an extent. So I think it is, there is definitely a place for um, much more online networking for sure. Mm. Uh, how do you actually partition that activity in your your working week? I mean, this is this is not simply recreation for you. This is actually part of your approach to doing research and being effective in research. So, how do you how do you actually you know, think of that as part of your working week? Um, it is difficult because if you let it, it can stray into being, like you say, recreational. But um, someone said to me when they first recommended that I join Twitter, um, I can scroll through my Twitter feed, which is curated so that it's only my field and related scientists and scientific information. I can scroll through that feed and in five minutes, I can get a really good understanding of what the latest developments are in my scientific research in, in my field. Um, people post new papers, people post new news stories about things that are going on. And 
those five minutes, if you spend that at the, the, the beginning of the day, like you would check your emails when you get to work, have a coffee, read your Twitter feed, make sure that you're kind of abreast of current developments, um, that can be really uh, helpful. And it's a very quick, digestible way of doing it. Um, and I find that very helpful. Of course, it, it for me, I find it very natural because I've um, grown up with social media to an extent, and I find it a lot more accessible. Um, whereas I know that other people might might not find that. Um, it just it comes relatively intuitively to me. So dear, do you have similar experience? Are you also on social media in in your environment and and research community? Yeah, uh, I use social media. Uh, in fact, uh, I have collaborated uh, with one of my colleagues through social media only, and uh, uh, I have uh, collaborated in two people uh, with uh, uh, social media for the papers. So it is useful uh, for uh, the collaboration. But uh, first, you have to know uh, their background, in which field they are working and all those things. So you can contact them through social media. If they respond, you can collaborate uh, with them and so on. So Mark, are you, do you feel that the, you know, the social media is, is actually uh, taking the market from train travel or is it actually train travel growing in Europe at the moment? Uh, well, the, really? the, the uh, sector uh, of train travel that's taking the biggest hit is actually the commuting to work and the working from home, <laughs> where we're seeing less people buy season tickets. But even looking at my career with the Department for Transport, there were so many occasions you wanted to go and talk to people face to face, because you can say face to face things that you just don't feel comfortable um, saying online. You can get them over with nuances that don't come over through uh, a laptop. Uh, and I think that's always going to be. Uh, we, we, we've had computers now for, for absolutely ages, and although conferencing is getting better, I, I don't think it's hitting the real business travel. I mean, of course, there'll always be occasions where you can avoid a meeting by uh, doing something online, but there are just so many occasions where it's better to do business face-to-face. -face. And of course, you get as much done on the train chatting to your colleagues and sorting things out uh, uh, as you do when you get there sometimes as well. Mm -hmm. What is it? What is it that actually is the better thing that you get when you're meeting people face to face? I I struggle to see. I feel it. I understand it, but I, I struggle to put my finger on what it is that actually makes meeting people face to face somehow better. Suzanne, do you have an insight into that and in thinking about EGUs going online? Uh, I think we, I'm definitely moving out of my science field here, but um, I think it probably has to do with, with how you read um, a person when you meet them, when you meet them. Um, so there's a lot of signals that, that probably will be less easy to pick up when you're talking on social media or, or even face to face. And I think before you reach the stage that you actually have a, a video call with someone, it's a bit of a hurdle. Um, whereas if you are at a, at a conference um, and you're having your coffee at a break or you're standing at a poster, it's just really easy to, to, to just say, oh, could you tell me a bit about what you're working on? Um, and, and I think it's just that aspect. And I totally acknowledge what, what Ella is saying about social media. I've also met people via Twitter. Um, and, and yes, that works, but it works in a different way. Um, and, and I think so far, and, and maybe this is a career stage from my age, but I've definitely made more contact at, at workshops and scientific meetings than, than I have done through, through email or, or social media. Is, it, is this really just a question of bandwidth? I mean, is it, it, am I going to be able to, within the next five or ten years, put on a virtual headset and walk around EGU and get equally lost in my virtual world as I did in the complex maze of EGU. Um, <laughs> Between the, the red level and the basement. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a difficult one. Um, I mean, I, I think see, a lot of the experiences that we, we're building up now in, in Corona times and bringing meetings online will change the meeting landscape. Um, and I can see some meetings work perfectly online. Um, 
I'm involved in, in a computer science meeting and that, that's, that will work very well and maybe it will stay online, who knows. Um, but I don't think we will go to a meeting landscape with only virtual meetings in the future. Um, I think there is just a, a human need to, to actually meet the people that you work with. Um, it's meeting new people, but also meeting your old friends and colleagues, having a face-to-face -face discussion about your projects. I see now some questions coming in from the audience and uh, maybe these, maybe it's a useful time to, to go to some of those. Um, there's quite a, a, a pointed question here. Um, I'm sorry I don't have a, uh, an indication of where these questions are coming from, but it says, and this is probably one for Suzanne, Copernicus make a lot of money from the EGU and a lot of money from registrations from people coming in person. Um, how does this influence the format of the conference? And, and could Copernicus you know, survive making less money out of it being an online conference? Uh, yeah, so to clarify, Copernicus is the conference organizer for, uh, for EGU. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we take registration fee to organize the meeting, but um, most of the, the registration fee actually covers organizing the meeting. Um, it's not that the General Assembly is making uh, heaps of money. We have to make some money because we have to cover the, the costs of EGU and the other outreach and education activities that, that EGU organizes. Um, Copernicus is, is like the, the EGU program committee, actually really enthusiastic about exploring different formats. Um, and I said, I mean, we, we started discussing this already um, in pre previous years. Um, and I, I think it will just mean, or just, it will mean a different way of organizing, a different business model. Um, so this year, Sharing Geo Science Online is free. Um, which is because we, we're not web streaming from a conference center. We went totally online. It's also an experiment. So we did not want to charge for this. Um, but I think in, in, in future assemblies, I mean, it could well be a way where when you participate online that you do pay a registration fee to, to cover the costs that we're actually making in organizing this. So um, I am no way afraid that you know, a different format would be a hinder. I think there is actually great enthusiasm in both Copernicus and EGU to look at different formats. Um, question for Sudhir, I think. Uh, could more regional conferences work better? Uh, is there a value in the, in the global conference, um, like EGU, AGU, those big conferences that people travel a long way to? It, it, could more regional conferences help? Uh, so uh, regional conferences, you uh, will meet people uh, like uh, through that continent only and uh, through global conferences you will meet uh, people uh, from different continents uh, like uh, and uh, the uh, people which are working uh, uh, top class in their field uh, in uh, global conferences they generally visit uh, there uh, whereas uh, in regional conferences uh, only that continent people most most of the people are from that continent uh, so uh, the quality uh, of the conference matters in the global uh, prospect uh, global conferences you will uh, meet uh, more uh, quality type of people uh, than the regional conferences like okay um ella do you have a feeling around regional conferences versus global conferences would you rather save up your carbon emissions and go to one big global conference or would you favor more regional? I mean, to an extent, I already have that with something like AGU versus EGU. Um, and I think like Sudhir said, it is, you do just meet people from your, it's difficult um, regardless. And I think, like we've been talking about the in-person element is really important but we do have to do something we have to lead by example particularly for me as a climate scientist i feel 
that if I am not doing my utmost to reduce my carbon emissions in my professional and personal life, then I'm a complete hypocrite. There's a question to our other scientist panelists. Do you feel that science must be leading the way in this, um, this area and this debate or there are other people who say that actually there's a halo effect, a reason um, the fact that many of us are involved in research around climate change and understanding the impacts of climate change on the earth system means there's a sort of certain halo that should allow us a free ride, if you like, in terms of carbon. Should we be leading or can we rest a bit on our laurels, Suzanne? <laughs> a firm shake of the head there. We can't rest. Of course we should be leading. I mean, it's the scientists who, who give all the warnings. Um, you know, climate science is a big field in your science. We are issuing the warnings. We, we should be, be giving an example by, by showing what is actually possible um, in our own behavior. And, and that might be at some times um, a bit painful in the sense that we have to choose to maybe not go to that meeting. Um, which is, you know, a two-day meeting at another continent. Or maybe we're not going to do that field work in that very interesting place. Um, but I do think we have a responsibility to show that this is possible. And how do we actually demonstrate that? How do we actually, you know, we can, we can lead and, and influence those around us and in our immediate sphere of researchers and colleagues and friends uh, but how do we actually demonstrate that in a more public way that we're doing something to reduce our own uh, and professional um, uh, carbon emissions? Does anybody post uh, their personal target for carbon emissions? Um, is that Ella? Is that something that you've thought of doing? Making it a no, more no, but maybe. I'm Sorry, um, yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting one. Um, it's a really interesting one because um, it may, definitely makes you accountable to everybody else. And I mean, it requires you to calculate it first, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of, of, there's obviously various different um, metrics for accounting for different things. I mean, it's not necessarily so straightforward. Um, I think that would be a really interesting idea if institutions did it and then we also did, had to disclose our i mean big companies have to do it so why shouldn't we as as leading scientists do it voluntarily or even as institutions mm. 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 yeah mark the, uh, to extend that discussion a lot of the um a lot of people have talked about uh, the, the, the carbon offsetting in a sense um do people by and large offset their train journeys as well as their flights or is it specifically a flight thing? Does carbon offsetting actually work in your mind? I haven't got any figures, but I, I am almost certain that most people don't. And I suspect most people don't offset their flights either. Um, I think there's an important point here. Sometimes debates like this can sort of head towards making grand gestures by going to conferences in Hong Kong via the Trans-Siberian Railway. And I think we need to recognize that it needs to be tackled from the other end in that there's still people, amazingly, uh, going to Heathrow or Stansted or Luton just to go to Edinburgh or Glasgow. Um, and even holidays to Switzerland or Italy or Spain can quite feasibly be substituted by rail. So I think it very definitely needs to be tackled from that end. Mm, okay. Suzanne? Well, quickly for Offsetting. <laughs> one of the things that we would have done this year if EDU had been in Vienna, was to carbon offset the travel of all participants. Um, and that would be regardless of the mode how they came, uh, train or, or bus or plane. Um, we, had, we had a bit of discussion about this. Is that I think personally it would have been a, a real milestone doing this. We would have been the first big meeting to carbon offset all the travel. But of course, the, the carbon is already spent, right? So you do it afterwards. Um, and, and that has been the bit where it's a bit uncomfortable, I find. Um, so it's a real step forward, but it doesn't take away the underlying issue. So what is your view on that, Mark? The, the, the underlying issue being that we actually have to burn the carbon before we're going to start to offset it. 
And then, of course, I guess that there, these schemes for offsetting, some are very much better than others at doing the job that they're saying that they're doing. So selection of those schemes is really quite an important um, route. Um, does anybody offset their travel? Sudhir, have you thought about doing that? It clearly adds to the expense of traveling, uh, especially long distances. Uh, yeah, like uh, rather than doing uh, multiple conferences in year, you can uh, choose the conference selectively for your, like uh, field specific conferences. Uh, like uh, one or two so you can uh, cut the carbon footprints rather than doing multiple conferences you attend the specific conference one or two in in a year in this way you can uh, reduce the carbon footprint hmm. so be selective rather than necessarily yeah. paying somebody else to uh, um, yeah offset your carbon um, let me just ask, Mark, do you still fly anywhere or are you firmly in seat 61? <laughs> well, if it's trying to get to Vietnam, then I will probably fly, but I don't fly in Europe and don't fly, certainly not in the UK and, and Ireland either. Mm. So uh, I will if I have to. And on, on most journeys, do you think it, it actually takes you longer or so? sort of similar to actually going hanging around in airports and uh, waiting for flights well the first point is that your one hour flight these days takes four hours so even a four hour train journey uh, can just be as as quick uh, as flying uh, and we've seen that change over the years um, the head of sncf used to said some years ago that the magic figure where rail competed with air was a three hour journey time because of half an hour to the airport, uh, an hour check in, an hour flight and half an hour into the city. That has now gone up to four or even five hours. And he cited uh, Paris Perpignan, which has got a five hour journey time with France's TGV, uh, and they've got a 50% market share. Mm -hmm. So things have definitely changed probably since 9-11 and the extra security came in uh, because uh, flying is certainly no longer glamorous. Uh, for leisure travel, of course, people are willing to consider the train for much longer. Uh, the most popular pages on my website are, uh, for European travel from the UK is not UK to France, that's number two. UK to Italy is always top, uh, Netherlands in third place, and UK to Spain in fourth place. And that's always, uh, that always surprises me. And following on is a message, uh, a question from the, our audience that says, how should we actually incentivize people to at least think about alternatives to airline travel? Um, any quick pointers on how to actually push people to thinking about uh, uh, alternatives? Ella? I was hoping you might uh, ask me that one. <laughs> um, I don't think we need to be pressurizing people in, to take individual action. I think it's more about changing the system that makes train travel appear inaccessible. It makes it inaccessible. It's so extortionately priced if you consider the carbon cost of aviation, um, which just doesn't reflect the actual true cost, the true environmental cost of, of taking a flight. We aren't able to travel sustainably because the way that our economic system is structured means that we aren't taking into account all of the costs. And if that changed, for instance, if we had an actual proper, I don't know, carbon trading system or an accurately reflective price, that might be a very big game changer. And I think the way we think we, we structure our kind of pricing systems is going to have to change and that requires a very big effort from big players like governments and even i mean in europe the eu for instance but we cannot do that as individuals even as institutes in various countries we have to kind of lobby for much larger scale change because that's realistically one of the the key ways that it will happen quickly quick enough for us to actually have an impact suzanne incentivizing people to consider alternatives is that something that we 
need to do in in a social sense or is it one that our organizations can take a lead in is it in their interests to uh, bring people in in a different way different mode of travel it is because because uh, like for edu it, it's the um, it's a responsibility of of a european geoscience union to to ensure that we look after our climate um and and i think that there is uh, different ways. I mean, I could see on the um, on the chat and in the questions already been pointed out the, um, the website of uh, Milan Clever, who did an analysis for EDU 2019, and it shows that um, a majority of the, the the carbon from travel to to the General Assembly in Vienna came from flights over 1,500 kilometers. Um, that was more than 85 percent. So the, the short haul flights, the, the ones within Europe, are, are not the big contributors. Um, where, whereas these are the short flights are the ones that are most likely to be done by train. Train also carries a carbon or cell, a carbon in many cases, huh? um, but much less. So, so, so the question is how how do we bring down the carbon of a big meeting when we know that a lot of the, um, the, the contributions come from these really long flights, and and that links a bit to what Sutir was saying. You know, if you want to to attend a conference in a different continent, it means a long haul flight. Um, so are there different ways of, of doing this? Um, and that could be uh, regional hubs, which has been brought up. Um, definitely one thing that I also saw brought up and it's what we've been thinking of, when, when you invite people to come, um, the idea is that they stay for a whole week and not just fly in for a talk and fly out, but really make the most of their experience. And one thing we've also been encouraging to do is that um, when you are already in Vienna, use the opportunity to meet with other people, set up meetings for your project with, uh, with other people. We offer meeting rooms free of charge. We encourage other workshops to tag on before or after so people can combine. So make the most of a trip. Um, it's, it's ways forward. Um, I'm not sure we're there, but I'm very happy to read more and more suggestions in the, in the chat and in the questions. Um, I'm going to move the discussion on a, a little bit now towards not just conferences, but towards the way that we actually deliver science. Many of us uh, are involved in field science. Um, often that takes us to quite remote places. Uh, British Antarctic Survey has a, a my own organisation has a, an annual schedule of taking people the 9,000 miles that across the world to, to work in the Antarctic and that involves in itself a great deal of, of carbon emissions from our ships and our aircraft. It, some of the science that we do does benefit climate change research but some of it actually doesn't and I wonder if in your mind there is a difference between the way that we should treat science that is addressing climate change in terms of its carbon emissions and the way that we're just doing science that maybe answers other questions that society is interested in. Is there a halo effect around uh, uh, climate change science or is it, should it just be seen as part of the rest of it? Ella, you've been involved in work in some faraway places. What was your feeling when you were involved? Uh, uh, guilt. <laughs> Um, no, you're right. I think it's, I think this one is slightly thornier than um, the conference issue because it, you can't really do virtual field work in the same way. Um, like you've said, there's this kind of halo effect possibly, like is the fact that I'm doing climate research in Antarctica justifying the fact that I had to fly to get there? Um, I'm not really very sure about that one and I think I'm very conflicted about it. Ultimately, uh, the kind of research that I was doing whilst I was there, I felt was really contributing very directly to our understanding of climate change. And I felt like it was very, uh, very helpful, very useful and very important. Um, but I don't know where you would draw the line because there's at some point going to be a balance where the the carbon cost of getting there and the carbon cost of being there. And I mean, I was involved in airborne observation campaign which is like the most carbon intensive form of field work you can do um so at some point it's going to outweigh the carbon um benefit of 
you know, uh, contributing to climate research. So it's really, really difficult. I'm, I'm not really sure I have an answer for that one, which is perhaps not that helpful. <laughs> do, do you, like me, feel that perhaps when we are expending a lot of carbon to do our research, that does put a, 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 an onus on us as scientists to be particularly open in sharing data and making sure perhaps that data gets used as many times as is possible is preserved properly and actually you know contributes to the the questions that we're really saying in our proposals that we're trying to answer absolutely and i think if we also make sure that whilst we're there we're really making the most of it so we're not just going for a week and doing some research it make you make sure that whilst you're there you really make the most of it kind of like that point about making the most of being in vienna for the whole week and not flying in for your talk make sure that you're getting the most data you possibly can, that you share it openly, that it's open source, that it's freely available for use by all people, um, and that it's nice and accessible and understandable, well labeled, that kind of thing. But also, I mean, as a climate modeler, I'm also going to say that we need to um, use, make more use of our models. And if we can validate them with more data, of course, as modeling gets better and better and better, we can start to rely a little bit more on that. Obviously, this is just me being my, uh, biased modeling self but i think all of these things are a, a, a thing that we need to work on together collectively it's going to be a collective effort if there's a way of sharing the load of field work so that different scientific teams don't all need to be there all at once hmm. perhaps you can combine research projects in some way uh, for instance if you're doing airborne surveys you can sort of combine the geosciences and uh, meteorology in some way Obviously, that requires a lot more collaboration, so it's a little bit more difficult. Yeah. Um, Suzanne, you've been involved in field work as well as EG, your organisation. Uh, is field work a luxury or is it something that is a, a rite of passage for, for geoscientists that, that need to have done some field work before they can become effective as researchers? <laughs> I've, I've not done that much field work myself. I'm a computer modeler. Um, but I've been at the Geological Survey of Norway for almost the last 16 years. Um, and, I, and I think the survey is in a sense lucky that they got the whole of Norway um, at their backyard. So they don't need to travel that far to, to study a lot of interesting um, geology problems. So, so, but I really like what, what Ella brought up, the, the open sharing. So, and, and I think this, this is a way that as, as a community, we, we need to think about. So, so that when somebody does travel far away and collect data and samples, that this is shared and maybe that will then take away the need for somebody else to go to the same area. So we should really document digitally um, everything that there is in that area and share it. Mm. Um, so dear, you, you travel to fit for do for doing geological field work? Is it, uh, it far travel? You, can you drive or can you, uh, do you have to fly? Uh, yeah, uh, basically uh, uh, I travel to field work via train every time. And uh, when it is very urgent, only then I have take uh, to flight. So in my uh, PhD only, I have done uh, 15 weeks of field work. Uh, all by mostly by train and uh, after reaching at the destination nearest destination of Firwa, I mm -hmm. take local cars to travel uh, and uh, uh, record the data. So, and do your samples are they uh, ones that you would share with with researchers once you finish doing your immediate problem, or are there networks that allow you to share your data and your sample? Yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, in this uh, case, uh, institutes uh, need to take a leap. Like uh, they have to uh, uh, take uh, data from researchers once they have uh, done field work, and uh, they uh, they have to make uh, some virtual online field work. Like uh, University of Leeds and some and other university have uh, done it, but uh, India. Uh, uh, we have to need uh, to make uh, such portals like uh, you have done lots of field work, have uh, very good uh, field photography structures, 
and uh, other data so uh, you can uh, uh, you can uh, make an online portal for this so uh, other researchers can uh, access this data and uh, this will save uh, their lots of time uh, mm -hmm. for accessing uh, that field area and uh, they can do other things in that same field area so comments I see coming in through the chat and the Q&A have also pointed out the high carbon cost of high performance computing and modeling and that modelers themselves should realize that poor code, for instance, creates more carbon than a, a well optimized computer model. Suzanne, is there any sense in which people try to improve their code from a from a carbon perspective as much as uh, from an efficiency one or is it just getting those cpu hours that's uh, the hardest thing i think it's a really interesting point hmm. um as far as i have seen the discussion is not that progressed yet um but there are um, initiatives in the sense that if you buy a new cluster, energy usage of the cluster is definitely one of the criteria that it's evaluated and, and it should be. The other thing is, of course, where does the electricity come from? Is, is, is it um, hydropower electricity? Is it a coal plant? Um, this matters. So, I mean, I think it's a very valid point. M many of the, the activities that we do, even without us thinking about it. They, they carry um, an electricity use and, and a carbon cost. I, in my career, I've also been used a lot of satellite data. And of course, it feels like that comes for free, but the whole infrastructure around putting a satellite into space is quite enormous and has a, a huge carbon footprint. So, um, those of us that use the data may not actually be uh, getting it for free in a sense. Um, we're kind of coming quite close to the end of our time now and I, I would like to just give you panelists a, a second to uh, just summarize what you think you would like people to take away from this debate uh, and take into the future. Um, Mark, yeah, you know, from the perspective of travel, what do you think people should be thinking about as as we move forward out of uh, the coronavirus world into a, a less lockdown situation? The key thing is just to check if there is a feasible alternative. Uh, it's not always easy to do so, um, but have a check. See, check the uh, check the net. See if there are any. Uh, is any information out there about train or ferry alternatives? Uh, and if there is an alternative, weigh it up against air travel and, and say, is it feasible? Because it very often is. You're, you're very modest in not saying check seat61.com. I will say it for you. I think it's a remarkable resource and I thank you very much for your efforts in putting it together. Thank uh, you. Sudhir, what are your closing shots on this debate? Uh, I think uh, researchers uh, should have to choose uh, their uh, contents selectively, which is more important for them. So uh, they can uh, take uh, that particular contents and uh, uh, not to do like more conferences in a year. So in this way, they can uh, reduce uh, carbon footprints. Naturally. Thank you. Ella. <laughs> what for the future? Um, I think my main points that I've taken away from this are that it's not just about individual actions and individual institutes, it's about trying to encourage that systemic shift, changing the cultures around how we do conferencing and field work. And that is going to be really difficult, but it's going to require um, much larger scale action, um, lobbying governments, etc. cetera. Um, and we really do need to lead by example as scientists and professionals in not just the climate sciences, but the geosciences. And I really like your idea of, um, declaring your carbon emissions. I'm going to make an effort to try and do that in future. So thank you. Suzanne, your final words. 
So we have not all been encouraged to post our carbon emissions. I think that's a very good one. Um, I've been very happy to, to, to see this great debate um, because I think discussions like this help our community forward. Um, and, and I think one, one thing that we didn't have a chance to touch upon much is that as a science community, we maybe also need to think about the criteria by which we evaluate or judge career progress. So when we ask of, of people that they attend meetings and present, do we, meet, do we mean in person? So maybe we should talk to funders as well um, and people who evaluate career progress to make sure that you know, different ways of doing field work and of participating in science communication um, are counted equally. So, um, I mean, in, in the case of, of EDU, I think um, Corona has allowed us to the positive effect of, of experimenting with bringing a meeting of our size online. Um, and we may well not have found the best way of doing this, but I, I think that it, I hope it will give us an indication of what might work for future meetings and what we could keep. Um, because finally, we're all responsible for our own carbon footprint. Thank you. So I, I absolutely agree personally with those, those responses. And this is a, an issue that is for individual scientists, their organizations, and indeed the funders to address and to show some leadership on. So I thank you very much. Um, what I've certainly taken about from this debate is really, you know, to, to think about my own personal actions. And I wonder in the chats that follow whether people will consider what they're going to do into the future uh, around their own carbon emissions as individuals and, and also as working scientists. I personally will make sure I check with the man in seat 61 um, to see whether there are alternatives to, to travel uh, by air and find perhaps to invest a little time in enjoying that travel in a way that maybe I haven't in the past few years. Um, it is time I think to close this debate. I thank all of the panelists, Suzanne, Sudhir, Mark, Ella, thank you very much for joining me this morning. Uh, I would like to thank Jenny Turton and our other conveners. Thank you very much. Uh, and that's it from me. Goodbye.